This presentation will be broken down into four sections as shown by the current slide. And I'm happy to take questions related to this topic at the end from the chat box in the Zoom call. Now in units one to two of the core curriculum, one of which was covered last week, we reached the conclusion that technological change improves long run living standards, but can cause short run unemployment by replacing labor. However, long run patterns of unemployment across countries are not explained by national differences in innovation over time. That leads me to two questions. How can institutions and policies explain these differences? And how can we model the effects of institutions and policies on long run unemployment and economic growth? The first piece of the puzzle that we will be looking at is unemployment. As shown by the graph depicting unemployment by year versus real wage growth, there are significant economic events that set off a sharp increase or decrease in unemployment across countries. The differences reflect uh, changes in institutions and policies across countries. Production has become more capital intensive without resulting in mass unemployment. How could this outcome occur? To answer that question, I will be moving on to my next slide, displaying a long run labor market model. The model may help to explain differences in labor market performance across countries and help us to look at the effects of technological progress on living standards and inequality. If we look at the countries with a reasonable unemployment rate, but relatively low real wage growth, it is important to ask why this particular phenomenon has occurred. Take the USA, for example. The majority of Americans share in economic growth is through the wages they receive for their labor rather than through investment income. As a result of this, although the economy as a whole has been growing, the primary way the vast majority of people benefit from this growth has slowed dramatically. This is reflected in the significant concentration of wealth that has taken hold in recent years, not only in developing uh, in, in fully developed nations, such as the US and the UK, but also in developing nations such as China and India. Moving on to the second segment on job creation and, on, and employment, it's important to examine technological progress and living standards concurrently. Firms can earn innovation rents by introducing new technology and firms that cannot, cannot keep up with this innovation eventually fail. This is known as creative destruction. Technological progress and capital goods accumulation are complementary because new technologies require new machines and technological advance is needed for increasingly capital intensive methods of production in order to be profitable. This process as a whole allows for a sustained increase in average living standards. When modeling technological progress, there are two consistent variables of measurement to look at, capital intensity of production and labor productivity. Technological progress rotates the production function upwards. This increases the APL and offsets the diminishing marginal returns to capital, which makes it profitable to invest domestically, leading to increased capital intensity. When we look at technological progress over time, we can see that countries that are rich today have had labor productivity rise over time as they become more capital intensive. Unlike the concave production function, capital productivity remained roughly constant over time in the technology leaders. This is because these countries experienced a combination of capital accumulation and technolog technological progress. Hopefully the graph below will help you to visualize that concept. Labor saving technological progress can also create jobs. However, around 50% of jobs globally could be automated away in the next few years, posing a challenge to many currently in the workforce 
who lack the ability to move to a role far from the reaches of cheaper, more effective labor savings. Job creation is strongly pro-cyclical, whereas job destruction is counter-cyclical. The beverage curve, shown below, shows the inverse relationship between the unemployment rate and the job vacancy rate. During recessions, firms post fewer vacancies and lay off more workers due to lower demand. During booms, firms post more vacancies and need more workers to cope with this rising demand. How do the implications of technology affect that landscape? Newly posted vacancies are not filled instantly because of issues with labor market matching. That can manifest in the following factors. In mismatching, where unemployed workers may not have the skills required for the said job, and job seekers and vacancies may, not, may be located in different parts of the country. There are, there's also the possibility of industry specific shocks or shocks that prevent workers from moving and this results in lower efficiency. However, policy and technology can approve this efficiency. And that brings me on to my third section. In order to explain trends and differences in unemployment over time, we can extend the labor market model to the long run. In the long run, firms can enter or exit the market, so capital stock can change. The long run employment rate depends on how well policies and institutions deal with work incentives and investment in incentives concurrently. The long run equilibrium in the labor market is when wages, employment level, and the number of firms are constant. I'll just stop for a moment to let you absorb the next two slides, as it's important to understand one of the more fundamental principles of the impact of technological change through the long run wage setting curve. In the example shown, technological change increased inequality in the short run, but reduced inequality in the long run. Employees' share of output returned to initial levels due to an increase in real wages. The higher real wage motivated employees to work at a lower level of unemployment. On the question of how long the long run actually is, the economy can go through a long adjustment process before reaching the new long run equilibrium. For example, in the adjustment of the US labor market to the Chinese import shock, where many economists thought that the shock would not have a major negative impact, certainly not as, as damaging as it was at the time, because workers in import competing sectors could easily relocate to other regions. So they believed that there would be a minor impact on wages or unemployment. However, they underestimated the size of the shock and overestimated the degree of labor mobility. As a result, 2.4 million jobs were lost and the labor market is still adjusting. In order to achieve good economic performance, an economy must tick two boxes. It must ensure that the price setting curve shifts up more than the wage setting curve, allowing for wage growth, and to adjust rapidly and fully so that the entire economy benefits from technological progress. As mentioned previously, a lack of adjustment for benefit for all can result in the concentration of wealth that we've seen in recent history. These cross country differences shown in the graph can be explained by institutions where inclusive trade unions that represent many firms and sectors have chosen not to exercise maximum bargaining power because wage increases often affect job creation in the long run. Where policies from well-designed unemployment schemes to job placement services have been able to achieve low unemployment rates. And there are three national examples 
of this that we're going to zoom in on today. In Norway, where inclusive trade unions and employers associations have set wage demands in accordance with the productivity of labor and also supported legislation and policies that shifted the wage setting curve downwards, further expanding long run unemployment. In Japan, where employers associations have coordinated wage setting across firms, deliberately avoiding raising wages by not competing in hiring the same workers. And finally, in Spain, where a combination of the two factors of non-inclusive unions and government legislation to protect jobs rather than workers, these factors may help to account for Spain's poor labor market performance. On changing labor market performance, institutions and policies make a big difference for employment and wage growth, but changing institutions or policies is difficult because it creates winners and losers. It always has. For example, the Netherlands and the UK both had increased unemployment rates in the 1970s due to the oil price shocks and the increased bargaining power of labor. Both countries eventually managed to shift the wage setting curve down, but they did it in very different ways. In the Netherlands, institutions became more inclusive as they did in Norway, in the example we looked at. And in the UK, policies enacted uh, were used to reduce the power of non-inclusive unions. The amount of labor devoted to agriculture declines as countries get richer, first moving to the second step of manufacturing. As was shown here in the UK after the Industrial Revolution, and then from manufacturing to services. The graph shows that China is in the midst of a manufacturing stage of sorts. It will be interesting to examine the eventual shift towards services that we've seen in the last five to 10 years, perhaps towards technological enterprise specifically. Labor has been moving out of manufacturing into services, which is slower productivity growth. Manufacturing productivity has increased as a result, shifting the feasible frontier. If we assume that services productivity is unchanged, and if consumption patterns do not change, the economy will be at point B shown labor has shifted from the production of goods to the production of services as a, an economy of a nation develops further. Does this actually happen? Yes, but some offsetting factors are excluded from this model. Productivity increases in some services like in music sharing or digital information have not been reflected in productivity increases in more manual services, potentially, where there is less space for innovation. There's been a substitution of goods for services. So if the relative price of a good falls, consumers typically increase the proportion consumed. There's been an increase in relative demand for services. As incomes rise, people may choose to spend more of their budget on services. And finally, import and export patterns, where international trade and opportunities for specialization have affected which sectors grow or decline. In conclusion, we have looked at the long run model of wages and unemployment. And we have seen that the long run price setting curve depends on incentives to invest and productivity, and that the beverage curve shows efficiency of long run adjustment. We've used a model to explain differences in labor market outcomes across countries. Institutions and policies do matter for long run outcomes and successful countries have been able to reduce the adjustment and diffusion gap by taking advantage of technological change. Uh, thank you to everyone. And if you have any questions please feel free to contact me at emma underscore howard at winkle.acuk or get in contact with anyone from the GAEE UK team. Thank you for coming.
Thank you, Matthew.